Well, we are in our final week of our series, Strong. In week one, we talked about building strong families. Last week, we talked about some points that we can help to help develop a strong marriage. And I really, really enjoyed having my wife, Kathy, up here for the last two weeks. Can we give it up for her one more time? She did an awesome job, and I know you wish she, she would just be up here every week, but... Hey, hey, stop it. Hey, hey, all right, let's, let's, there's, a, there's a limit, okay? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you missed either of those messages, uh, you can get caught up online, newlifecanton.com, or like Pastor Russ was talking about, our, our church uh, app is so great. It has everything you need on it. It's free download. Uh, just search at newlifecanton.com on your app store, and you can, you can get caught up that way as well. Now, for our final sermon, I've already alluded to this, we're going to talk about what it means to have a strong mind, a strong mind. I believe that our mind is the greatest physical asset that God gives us, our greatest physical asset that God gives us, and we need to do everything we can to steward it well and to take care of it. I've said these kind of things often from this pulpit, but it's not God's will that we are constantly struggling in our life, and especially in our minds. Paul tells his protege, his son in the Lord, in 2 Timothy 1.7, he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, Timothy, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, a strong mind. Now notice Paul gives three things that God has given us. Three things. Number one, power. Power. Power that he's talking about is connected to our spirit. Connected to our spirit. Jesus says you will be endued with power by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a spiritual thing. Number two, he says love. Love is connected to our heart or you could say our soul. And then number three is the mind. That is connected to our body. God has created us. You've heard this before. Body, soul, and spirit. Folks, this is what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Come on, we do not exist randomly. You can believe that if you want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to believe I've got a purpose, that God has created me and gifted me with a purpose, and I, he has you as well. We do not exist randomly. We're not here by accident. Everybody look at me. God knows your name. God knows right where you are this morning. And God cares about every aspect of your being, body, soul, and spirit, power, love, and a strong mind. And we're going to focus today on the mind. It's been said that the most difficult spiritual battle that we will face as believers occurs between our ears. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. That wasn't very good, but I'll, I'm going to preach anyway. I would definitely, definitely agree Come on, sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Satan is real. Satan is real. His demons are real. That hierarchy, that government structure is real. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a legend. It's, not, it's, it's absolutely real. But folks, Satan is not coming up with anything new. If it was a contest, he would not be getting any originality or creativity points for what he does. He simply comes against us with things we already struggle with, things that we are already leaning towards, things that we struggle with where? In our mind. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. No, we're not guns or politics or money or those things. On the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension. That word also means pride that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul is letting us know in no uncertain terms that we are in a battle. We are in a war. I did an entire series called Behind Enemy Lines. Folks, you know, this is Satan's turf. This is his, that Paul and Jesus both call him the God of this world with a little g. This is his turf, and we're in a battle. He's saying, but we're not fighting in conventional ways. We're not using guns and, and bullets and tanks. 
And our job, our, our, our battle assignment is to demolish, I love that word, demolish spiritual strongholds, mental strongholds. That's our battlefield. And much of that battle takes place where? In the mind. Look at the screen. A stronghold is a mental block with spiritual ramifications. A stronghold is a mental block. What are you talking about? It's not just a physical thing. A stronghold is not just a, it reaches past our physical mind into and affects our spirit. It's serious. It's something that will keep you from from moving further in your faith. It brings your spiritual growth to a grinding halt. And if it stops, it eventually is going to start going backwards. This mental block, this stronghold can be one of two things. Number one, a secular worldview. Atheism, Gnosticism, consumerism, relativism, any ism that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And the root of that is pride. Anything that sets itself up against the word of God and that resists and pushes back against this is a secular worldview and it is a stronghold. Have you ever been with a friend or family member and maybe you invited them to church or I don't know, whatever, and they, the, the power of God was just, you could feel the presence of the Lord and you're like, thank you, Jesus. This is what they needed. This is, man, this is so awesome. I'm so glad they're here today. And they're sitting there and they could be sitting on a park bench in the, you know, eating lunch. It's like, you know, is anything getting through? It's not because it's a stronghold. It's a spiritual stronghold. And that's when you and that's when me as the body of Christ have to agree together in prayer to tear that thing down so that the Holy Spirit can move in their life. Pull that thing down so that they can receive Christ and that stronghold can be broken. That's our job. Come on. Paul's saying that is your job. You've got to, to be praying to pull those things down in people's lives. But as believers, this isn't the main issue with us. The second type of stronghold is a personal battle in the mind. A personal battle in the mind. Hey, nobody else knows what's going on up there, do they? Somebody say amen. Amen. Come on, I'm preaching. It's a good thing. (laughs) Nobody else may really know what's happening in there. Now, we, we talk about strongholds. That's kind of a Christianese kind of thing, religious term. We talk about that immediately. If we've been in the church, we think of things like pornography and lust and unclean thoughts. And those are certainly there and real. But we often leave some things out. Worry can be a stronghold. Anxiety can be a stronghold. Seeking the approval of others. Fear, guilt, resentment, insecurity, anger, You fill in the blank. All of these things can become strongholds in your mind, mental blocks that hinder you, that weigh you down, and keep you from fulfilling your purpose in Jesus Christ. That's all Satan wants. Listen, if he can't have your soul, if if, if you've already given your life to Jesus, his next game plan is to keep you out of the game. That's all he wants is to keep you sidelined, not using your gifts, thinking you're less than that, thinking you're condemned and always worried about the wrong thing and think I can't get in the game. I'm not worthy. I'm not this. I'm not that. That's what Satan, that's a lie from the enemy. He wants to keep you out of the game and away from your purpose in Jesus Christ. It's a mind thing. It's a stronghold. That's why Paul is so adamant that we must tear them down to destroy these things in our mind. Precious brother in the Lord at another church where I served became a close friend. And I walked through a season with him where he was battling so severely with depression and other things in his mind. The only word I can come up with to describe it is tortured. He was tortured in his mind. And I walked for months with it through that season with him of being tortured in his mind. He would make, he would go forward a little ways and then he would seem like three steps, you know, two steps forward, three back. It would just be, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Tortured. 
in his mind. In the Old Testament, King Saul, that, that was his problem. It was his issue. He was tortured in his mind. The only thing that would give him any relief was the anointing of God that was upon David when he would play the harp. I feel the presence of the Lord. But he didn't allow the Lord to permanently do a work in him, and he lost his kingdom because of that, because of those things in the mind. Our text tells us to take captive every thought. The Greek word here means to control, to conquer, to bring into submission. That is military. That is militant. That is violent. And that's what it takes sometimes. Now, it sounds good, Paul. You're right. We definitely have an issue in our mind. We, we all know that. But how do I do that? Can I get an amen? Come on, we're being honest today. How, Paul? Come on, that's great. I acknowledge there's issues. But how do I take captive every thought? How do I? That's e definitely easier said than done. I don't know about you, but my mind doesn't always like to mind. It's often quite rebellious. It often, when I'm wanting to think one way, it goes the other way. <laughs> one of the things that I struggle with in my quiet time, can I be real today? Can I, just, I, I am anyway, so it doesn't matter. No, we want you to be fake with us, Pastor, because we, we want to hide, continue to hide behind this mask that we have and come into church and just be like, I'm fine, it's all right. Come on. You came to the wrong church. <laughs> So I'm in my quiet times, and I, and I guard those. I've, I've preached that many, many times. You have to guard that time with the Lord every day. You have to get filled up for the day and get vision for the day and strength for the day. But in my quiet time, I get praying. I'm like, whoo, got some Holy Spirit fire. I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And then a thought comes in my head, and I'm like, squirrel! <laughs> and I'm gone. I lay it, sometimes I'll, I'll lay, lay down at night. A lot of times I'll be laying down at night, and my brain will not stop. It will not shut off and I'm hours laying there. Am I preaching to anybody? And that's not necessarily in sinful. What about sin? What about sinful thoughts and sinful? What about the outcome of, of those thoughts? Look at the screen. The battle for sin always starts in the mind. The battle for sin always starts in the mind. Paul talks about this in Romans 7, 15. He says, I don't really understand myself. <laughs> Can anybody say amen? <laughs> for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I, I end up doing what I hate. I'm so glad Romans 7 is in the Bible. It gives me hope. Come on, does it you? I'm glad it didn't go from Romans 6 to Romans 8. Romans 8 is all about victory and the answer, and we need to embrace that. But if he hadn't talked about his own struggle in Romans 7, it would have been like, yeah, you're a superhero, Paul. But he's very honest, and you can feel the tension. Paul was no different than you and I. He was not Jesus. He was dealing with the same battle of the mind. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced it's the hardest battle that we will fight this side of heaven. Everybody look at me but we can't give up. We can't throw in the towel. Why? Because there's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. Losing the battle of the mind, once again, will keep us sidelined. It will keep us from our purpose in Christ. Constantly losing this battle will rob us of a preferred future. Losing the battle of the mind will lead to destroyed families. It keeps us anxious and uptight. It causes us to lose sleep. It affects our health and our well-being. It affects our children and our families. Come on, the stakes are too high to give up. We must learn. Just like a soldier, we must be trained and must learn how to fight and win in our mind. Give God praise if you believe that. Come on. Fortunately, the Word of God gives us many things and principles and tools that we can use. They've always been there. It's not anything new. They've always been there. The problem is we ignore them. We don't apply them. I want to go over two, just two principles that the Word of God gives us to win the battle in our mind. Number one, don't believe everything you think. 
Don't believe everything you think. I know you want to because you thought it. It's kind of like that internet commercial that says, you know, well, it's on the internet, so it must be true. That's crazy, right? We all know that's crazy, but it's just as crazy to think everything that goes through your head is true. Those people are whispering over there. They must be talking about me. You laugh. But we all have those kinds of insecurities, and it, it, that's paranoia. It's not reality, right? It's, it, it's not real. Come on, we all do it. Come on, we are all bombarded with false ideas all the time. And then what Satan does, he just blows it up. He just magnifies it and makes it bigger. But our problem goes much deeper than Satan. Our deepest problem, everybody, is sin. Corrupt mind. The Bible gives us a dozen different words for the condition, the condition of our minds under sin. Confused, anxious, closed, evil, restless, rash, deluded, troubled, depraved, sinful, dull, blinded, corrupt. That's Old Testament and New Testament. Folks, our minds are being renewed. It's a sanctification. If we, we know Christ, they're being renewed, but they are still under the influence of sin. And that's why we can't always trust everything that goes through them to be absolutely true. Come on, we have an amazing ability to lie to ourselves. Nobody gonna, all right, fine, it's fine. All right, no, you don't have to clap. You're too late. But you do it all the time, and so do I. We tell ourselves that things aren't really as bad as they are. Or the other side of the coin, some of you say, it's much worse than it really is. Yeah, that's for you. <laughs> Come on, we, te we tell ourselves, we tell ourselves, hey, we're doing, we're doing okay when we're not okay. I don't, I'm, I'm fine, I, I know, I know, but I, I, I can handle it on my own. I don't need any help. Can I tell you, this is one of the main reasons we, you see so many fallen Christian leaders who isolate themselves. And I know exactly that this temptation, because that's my personality and I'm a Christian leader. We get isolated. And when you isolate yourself, the enemy can come in. The enemy can mess with you. But look at the screen. All sin begins with a lie. All sin begins with a lie. The Bible says in John 8, that Satan is the father of lies. Listen to me. If he can get you to believe it, he can get you to sin. If he can, I, not, not, it doesn't matter how crazy and ridiculous it sounds, it's, it's a process. He, if he can eventually get you to believe the lie, he can eventually get you to participate in it and to sin. No matter how ridiculous it sounds at first, he, he wears you down. Remember his name? I've preached this before, Diabolo. It means throwing a ball over and over. That's his name! Hitting the exact same spot over and over and over again until it breaks. That's his tactic. That's all he does. And he knows which stone, which block to hit in your life. And he knows which one to try to hit in my life. One of the biggest reasons, and I need you to hear me, one of the biggest reasons why you can't believe everything you think is that you are preconditioned to see what you want to see. A scientific fact, look at the screen. Your brain tells you what you, what you see, not your eyes. Your brain filters and tells you what you see, not your eyes. That's why you can put four people at the scene of an accident and get four different reports about what happened. The bottom line is we must constantly remind ourselves and others that we love not to believe everything that goes through our head. What do we do, pastor? We test it. Every, every, everything. We test it against this word. We test it against the standard. What is a standard? Something that never, ever changes. It's like a tape measure. 
Would you go and to cut a board and go, well, that's about 14 inches, that's good. No, you'd be wrong. You would miss it. You take the standard of measurement and you make the mark and you cut it. This is our standard, not this. Because this is going to change depending on what we had for lunch, depending on what somebody said to us when we got to work, depending on when, the, the text from our kid that says, I'm sick, I've got a fever, I need you to come get me, and you've got a million things that you know you've got to do. Everything changes constantly, 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 but this will never change. So no matter what, you take that and you test whatever it is against the word of God. If it is confusing to you at all, you don't listen to what somebody says about you. You listen to what the Word of God says about you. You don't listen to, to the naysayers about your future and, and, and your value. You listen to what God says and what Jesus says about you and your future. And you name that and you, you believe that and you stand on that. His Word. So number one is don't believe everything you think. Number two is guard your mind. Guard your mind. Finish this thought for me. Garbage in? Let's do it again. Garbage in? That's old. That's old school. And it's cliche, but it's absolutely true. Proverbs 15, 14 says, A wise person is hungry for knowledge, while the fool feeds on trash. Let's go with this food analogy for a second. A nutritionist will tell you there are three kinds of food that people put in their physical bodies. There's brain food. Did you know there's food that makes you smarter? It actually makes you smarter. Unfortunately, to me, it tastes awful. I have to really struggle with that. But there is actually food that makes you, <laughs> that makes you smarter. <laughs> Say, Pastor, I need some of that. Um, listen, and then there's junk food which doesn't taste awful. And not just candy bars, pepperoni pizza, cheeseburger, my God, I'm feeling, fries. Woo! Yeah, but see, the problem is they're, they're, they're empty calories. They really don't do your body any good. They're just kind of there, and they just kind of make you bigger and all that. But they, man, they taste so good. And then there's, there's some foods that are simply toxic and poisonous to your body. The same is true when we talk about what we allow into our mind. The same is true. Some things will make you smarter to look at and to embrace and to see and to watch and experience. Some things will make you even, will make you godlier, like being in church and, 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 and doing things in the body of Christ. Then there are the, <laughs> there's just a huge amount of stuff that's neither good nor bad. Paul says it, it, it's lawful, but it's not helpful. It's lawful, but it's, it's just really not helpful. And we waste an awful lot of time and brain energy on stuff. Stuff that really doesn't count for much of anything. Now, I, I mean, I understand. A little, I think a little bit, a little bit is okay because sometimes I just need the veg. Anybody? Come on. Am I the only one? Come on. Sometimes I just don't want to think. I get done with something and I'm, I'm just like brain fried and I'm like, it's just, I, I don't want to, I'll watch, honey, let's just watch HGTV. I'll watch even people go buy houses. I don't care. I'll watch a, a, a competition for food. I just want to, I don't care. I just want to veg for a minute. My uh, Sabbath day is Friday. It's obviously not Sunday. Um, but my Sabbath is, and by the way, every one of us in this room, you need to guard a Sabbath day. You need to figure it out. Figure it out. If it's Sunday, praise the Lord for that. But guard a Sabbath day. It's, it's, it's needed spiritually and it's needed physically in your life. But Friday's my day. I usually start in the morning with, uh, with, with a devotion. I kind of finish up a little bit. I'm not really even supposed to do this, but I, I end up sending my notes to the media and stuff like that. And then I go and I eat by myself. You're like, that's weird. That's what I want to do. Okay, that's what I want to do. I enjoy going out and just sitting there and just not having to order for somebody else or, worry, or talk to somebody else. I know that's like, that's so weird, but it's me. It's your pastor. And then I'll do something even more weird. I might go watch an action flick or something at the movies by myself. I need to tell you, if you see Pastor Allen 
by himself at the movies. My marriage is not falling apart. I'm not in a midlife crisis. None of those things. It's, it's okay. It's fine. Just leave me alone. It's fine. Totally, totally, totally fine. Everything's good. So a little bit, okay, but listen, most of us, <laughs> most of us, most of us, including me, spend a whole lot more than a little time on the stuff. On stuff that just really doesn't count and really doesn't help anything. So my challenge is, hey, let's set some parameters intentionally on the stuff. And by the way, parents, your kids aren't going to do this on their own. <laughs> They're not going to be watching YouTube on their tablet and after an hour go, oh, you know what? My time's up. I'm just going to set this aside. <laughs> not going to happen. So we have to put guardrails up for them as well. But then there are some things, listen, that are absolutely toxic for us to watch and see and take into our soul. I don't have to make a list of those. You know exactly what those things are that should never voluntarily be taken in. Folks, as believers in Jesus, there are certain things, certain movies, certain websites that we should never visit. There are certain places that we should never go. Is that old school? I don't care. That's just the bottom line because they're toxic to us. Psalm 101.3 says, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I will refuse. It's a choice. Now, if it's an addiction, the first step to freedom and healing is admitting that there is a problem. And folks, we've got to get rid of this idea of, of attaching shame to somebody that's trying to get help. Amen. And I want to commit to you as your pastor right now that if you're, especially a man in this room, and you, you have an addiction, especially to something like pornography or something like that, and you need someone to come to talk to, I, I will be that person if you need, and there will not be judgment, there will not be shame, there will not be condemnation, there will only be prayer and help and accountability in Jesus' name. That's my commitment to you. But if we think we can allow anything, just anything, to come into our mind, any, any of these toxic images to come into our mind and not be affected by them, we are fooling ourselves. We're kidding ourselves, and Satan will demolish us. He'll devour us. All right, that was awfully heavy, and sometimes when we talk about the mind, it is heavy, but I want to end on some, with some hope. How about that? With a scripture about some hope, about what we can do to guard our heart. Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Can we read that together? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Then, thank him for all he has done. That's two parts. Tell him what you need. Tell him the issues and the problems. But then thank him for what he's already done. It's amazing that we leave that part out so often. Come on, an attitude of gratitude. We've got to be thankful for what he's already done. Then, everybody say then. Then, after you've done these things, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will, here we go, will guard our hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. How do you know you've got this peace? How do you know you've got this, this peace that passes understanding? When you stop trying to constantly resist and overanalyze and overthink everything that God is trying to do in your life and simply obey and simply trust him with it. I know you, why you didn't clap there. No, 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 no. I'm going to preach now. An extra five minutes. No, I'm just kidding. I know because you're not there yet and neither am I. But as I grow in my faith and I grow in my relationship with Jesus, 
I'm getting more and more glimpses of that peace and more and more seasons of that peace are coming into my life and I like it. It's a whole lot better than the alternative. Somebody say, now clap if that's what you want. Come on. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. That's not a bow your head and close your eyes prayer. That is an ongoing conversation throughout the day where we invite the Holy Spirit into every aspect of our lives. Come on. That's what Paul is talking about in another place in Scripture where he says, pray without ceasing. You cannot hide in your bedroom and lay on the floor all day long. You've got to go to work. You've got to provide for your family. You've got to go to school. You can't do that, but you can have a conversation. It's a whispered prayer and going down the, the hallway at school. It's a whispered prayer going down the road on the way to work or at work. It's a whispered prayer at Walmart, especially at Walmart. <laughs> you might have to shout unto God with a loud voice at Walmart so you don't lose your salvation. Don't, don't send me any emails about, anyway, that's fine. Listen, this is what he's talking about. We can invite the Holy Spirit into every aspect of our life and pray without ceasing. And as we do that, as we begin to invite him in, not just in the morning or not just at lunch when we pray over the food, but throughout the day, that's when we'll begin to, to, to experience this peace that passes understanding that will guard our hearts and our minds. Amen. In verse 8, Paul says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. One final thing. Fix your thoughts. Everybody say that. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. All right, I'm about done. Listen to me. Fixing our thoughts, you've got to get this, is one of the biggest keys to overcoming temptation. Fixing our thoughts is one of the biggest keys to overcoming temptation. You cannot, listen, you got to get this. You cannot simply resist temptation and win. Why? Because you're still thinking about it. I resist, I resisted, I resisted, I resisted, I resisted, I resisted, I resisted, I resisted. I re you're still thinking about it. You can't simply resist and overcome it. When my... Uh, when I was little and I would fall and scrape my knee or fall out of a tree or whatever it was that happened, you know, she would come and scoop me up. She would hold me, and as she was tending to this injury or whatever it was, she would be talking nonstop. But she wouldn't be talking about the injury. She'd be talking about anything and everything to get what? My mind off the problem, the pain. And it's the same thing. Look at the screen. Do not merely resist temptation. Replace it. Do not just resist temptation, replace it. In other words, and I didn't put this up there, but you might want to write it down. Whatever gets your focus eventually gets you. Whatever gets your focus eventually gets you. You cannot just resist it. You have to replace it. If you don't, you're going to lose the battle. Paul would say, look, if you're just trying to resist it, that's great. That's fantastic. But that's only half of the battle plan. You're missing the other half. You have to be intentional about fixing your thoughts on what is true and pure and admirable and excellent. All right. Big idea. Our mind is a gateway to our spirit and our soul. So let us guard it with all diligence and responsibility. Our mind is a gateway. Come on, you can't just take things in and it not affect your spirit and it not affect your soul. We've got to guard our mind with all diligence and responsibility. Why? Because there's too much at stake.